Hi, I'm Fred McNeil, and thank you very much for watching QAC TV 7. We've started a show called Thank You for Serving. There are 3,353 veterans who live in Queen Anne's County, and what we're doing every week is bringing you one of the veterans. He or she will tell their story. You'll find it very interesting, sometimes funny, sometimes sad, but certainly enlightening. And Joe, I'd like to welcome you and say thank you for your service. Thank you, for How about introduce yourself to the camera in the TV world? I am uh, Joe Sykes. I live in uh, Symphony Village here in Centerville, and uh, I spent about 30 years in the Navy. And uh, I'm happy to serve and happy to be here and talking about it. And thank you for coming. Joe, we always start out, where, born and raised where? Are you Maryland or where? I was, I was born in Augusta, Georgia. I grew oh. up in Cleveland, Ohio. You're kidding me. I was the oldest of 11 kids. My father saw m many college payments coming down <laughs> With and 11. said, what would you think about going to the Free Naval Academy? <laughs> Yay. And he sent me in to take a test. I did really well in it. Next thing I knew, I was, had an appointment to the Naval did, Academy. Did you want, I mean, was that like a dream to go to the Naval Academy? No. No. Uh, I went in to help my father okay. be able to pay for education. <laughs> okay. Thank and, you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. And then uh, I went in, and when they give you the form, they say, "Where do you, what academy do you want to go to? And I said, well... My dad was in the Navy in World War II. Uh, Roger Staubach was pretty cool this year. Oh, that was yes. the year he won the Heisman Trophy. Yeah, you're playing Texas in the Cotton Bowl yeah, or something. So yeah, so Navy, that's where I want to go. Okay. And I okay. got an appointment, and next thing I knew, I was at the Naval Academy. Right. So. Now, you graduated in 68. Graduated in 68. Thank you for wearing this shirt. Okay. Now, I always ask my Academy uh, folks, how was the Academy experience in 100 words or less? Did you really like it, or was it as tough in those days as they say it was? It was tough, and to be honest with you, first couple of years, if I had another alternate life plan, you'd take it. I might have considered doing that, okay. frankly. But I, uh, it worked out great. I couldn't have had a better career. Okay. It wasn't always obvious to me when I was at the academy I was going to like it as much as I did. So. Now, did you at the academy? Besides, in the '60s, the academics were just amazing, right? I mean, diff difficult. Is what well, I mean. they were. We, were, but we were uh, at the time when. Uh, it was liberalized in the sense okay, that everybody change. did not take the same courses. Okay. At one point, everybody that came took, to the academy took yes. the same courses regardless of what your background And they were was. notorious flunk out courses. And, and so yeah. anyway, um, it was the education was good then, and, uh, and the timing was interesting because I graduated the summer that uh, both Robert F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King were. 60, yes, yeah, 68. Just, just a couple of months before I graduated. Okay. All that, that's what was going on in society. Mm. And the whole country went bonkers for about 10 years, yes. I think. Yes, and you that were part of that. That offensive happened right then. It was all going Everything on. Everything going time, on. Yeah. Now, you graduate from the Naval Academy. You, graduate, you were commissioned an ensign. Yes. So where did, now where did Uncle Sam have planned for you? So then I was wanted to fly, so I went down to uh, flight training in Pensacola. Pensacola. And uh, went through the whole flight training command, picked out what I wanted to do. I, I was married, and so I was starting a family. So I didn't really want to be on a carrier. Right. I wanted a, a land-based airplane. You had a base you could fly to it back to, yes. And the airplane I was trying to get into was the one you see next to me here, the P-3 Orion, which is a maritime surveillance aircraft, which lands on land every day. Okay, so you knew you were coming home for dinner yes, or a late night exactly. snack or something. And, uh, and then they send you through uh, the training to learn how to fly that specific plane. Okay. It, now, what was flight school? Are they trying to flunk you out? Or no. Is it, no, no. During the Vietnam War, they needed pilots they needed really bad. Desperately, okay. okay. <laughs> there were some guys that came through with me. I was kind of wondering how they got through, but you know. <laughs> well, I remember in Army basic training, they made an announcement, and we were all enlisted. Anyone have a uh, pilot's license? And this guy said, "Yeah, I've had one for 20 years." Next thing I knew, he was a captain, flying uh, fixed yes. wing for the Army. Yes. Uh, now, so okay, we go to Pensacola. They train you for this particular plane. Yes. Whose duty is surveillance? Am I correct? Or? Its main duty is to find Russian submarines. Okay, now, so you were so north we learned Atlantic a lot or? of anti-submarine warfare. I went from Moffett Field, which is where I graduated. Now, where's Moffett Field? That's in California. California, okay. I graduated from the P3 training. All right. And then you pick what your squadron is, and my squadron was VP17 in Barbers Point, Hawaii, and so I was then sent to my first squadron in Hawaii. 
Um, Which sounds like pretty good duty. The Hawaii part of it, not the rest. I took advantage of it. A lot good, of people good. seem to be afraid to go to Hawaii because it seemed too remote. They only saw it on TV. It wasn't like a real place. No, but and, it was beautiful. Uh, I said, send me there. I had been there when I was at the academy, so I loved it. Okay, see it again. So I chose it. It was pretty easy to get there back then. And uh, showed up at my squadron, and then six months later, our first deployment was to the Philippines so and Vietnam. So, so you spent six months, what, flying around Hawaii and training missions, et cetera? Just learning how to fly the, in the squadron. Any right? particular things about flying this particular? I mean, does it have any, anything difficult, easy? No, good, and, no? and to clarify, I'm... Okay. I'm a naval flight officer, so I'm a backseat guy. I'm you're the guy that guy. coordinates. So you're not, your hands aren't on the wheel? No, I'm no. coordinating the seven guys that are in the back of the plane trying to find the submarines. Oh, okay. And um, unfortunately, they sent us to Vietnam, mm. <laughs> and there weren't any submarines. Robert McNamara said. There were no submarines there to go looking for. <laughs> okay. And so we, uh, our main mission was the one that I'm going to talk about here okay. during well, Vietnam. Well, let's start right there. Okay, that's so yes. let me just check. You're still, were you Lieutenant J, J, G by then, or were you by the time I, By the time I got to uh, Vietnam, I was a Lieutenant J.G. So yes. you're Lieutenant J.G. Now tell us about these. So hello, you're flying over Vietnam or the coastal So what, what happens is the, squ the whole squadron, which is nine airplanes. Okay, nine, nine goes, planes just like this. Goes to the Philippines. Okay. And three of those planes are always either in Cameron Bay, Vietnam, or okay. Utapau, Thailand. Okay, Cameron Bay, I know. Now Thailand is Bill Moore's secret war or not? Not really. Okay. This okay. was... Utapau, Thailand was really a B-52 base. It oh, had so B-52s bomb, taking bomb, out every oh, okay. 15 minutes. So there was no secrets. But the little three uh, P-3 airplanes were okay. there amongst all of these B-52s. Okay. And we would, uh, a lot of my flights were out of Thailand. I flew out of uh, Vietnam a couple of times. But uh, our, jo our job was to stop the North Vietnamese from rearming the Viet Cong and the Mekong Delta. Okay, now explain to everybody the idea of the Ho Chi Minh Trail or the infiltration. Why don't you help I us out I got a nice here? picture here. There we go. Thank you. For so here's that. Vietnam. Thailand is over here. Now, just for us, how many miles? Are we talking hundreds of miles or thousands yeah. of miles? Hundreds of miles. Okay. A couple hundred miles. And this is Cam Ranh Bay, which is the base in Vietnam okay. itself. Which and is a huge base at that time. Yeah, it was yeah. a big base. Yes. And this is the Mekong River Delta, which is much like the Mississippi River Delta. Okay. This is a little, huge body little of them. Well, the river spreads out into many little canals okay. and rice paddies. And, okay, all over. All and there over. was much of the war was fought there yes. uh, with the uh, riverine forces, uh, the, um, the Marines that are there. The, the, Your neighbor, Dave, uh, Dave right? Who yeah, was a hard Dave, was down down there. Yes. Dave was down there. And... Um, and so our job was to fly these tracks that you see around the this outside. This is actually your flight pattern right yeah. here. These two tracks, there would be a, a P3 on each of these every day, starting at daylight. Okay, he's up, he's flying, and he's and flying. And we'd fly this till thing. dusk, and we're looking for the little boats that are trying to, to get arms into the South Vietnam. So you're not, you're over the water. Yes. Okay, help me out. Now, how long would it take to run this particular flight? They're about flight? 10 or 11-hour flights. Oh, so that's... Whole, 10 or 11 hours? Yes. Uh, how and do you so, okay, go ahead. Well, you can't, sink, you can't sink these boats until they move into the territorial waters of South Vietnam. Really? So we're trying to detect them before they try to get in. Okay, so... Okay. And there would be ships all around here that you would call into if you found one trying to get in there, and the ship would come over and intercept it and now sink how, it. How, again, for an I mean, arm, army, I know nothing. How big, are we talking sandpan? What are we talking infiltrating weapons and arms with what? Well, I just so happened to would like to okay, show you great. what we're talking about. Great. Here's a picture of the kind of trawler that was being used by the North Vietnamese. To, now, so this is not the Russians or the Chinese? This is about a 120-foot long fishing boat. Oh, that's a, that's a good boat, good boat. Which, off the coast of South Vietnam, there are only hundreds of fishing boats. But we had intelligence pictures like these that showed the ones that were known to be u being used to infiltrate arms. Now, could you, so you're fly, so help me out, you're flying over, you're picking up contact, yes. and your intelligent people are telling you that's And probably, we fly down and we look at it. Oh, you actually do visuals. Oh, you're right on top <laughs> of this thing, okay. It's nice the Navy comes prepared for the yeah. Army, thank you. Yeah. And so we would, uh, we would fly down and go past it. It's interesting because I said we flew from dawn to dusk. Right. 
early in the war, and this this is called Operation Market Time. Market it time. was started in the 65, 66 time frame. Early Vietnam. Yeah, early this Vietnam. is 1970-ish when I'm oh, there. Right. Five years later. And uh, early in the war, because we carry a, a f four million power candle power searchlight, oh, so you could spot. we would fly all day and all okay. night. But if you have a big light like that, the ship on the on the water can see you twice as far away as you can see him. Oh, so they see this light beam coming. And so there were a couple of planes that were shot down in the late 60s. These, these folks had armaments to shoot you down? Well, just not, not, not significant oh. rockets, but they, had, they were carrying guns to start with. So, but they could shoot you down with small arms fire. Well, if you're that close, rifles. yes, you yeah. could do that. And now, so we lost yeah. a couple that way, and so they decided it wasn't that smart to fly at night. No, so we stopped <laughs> the doing that. The big lights ain't on the By the time here. I got there, we, we weren't flying at night anymore. Now, Joe, let me ask you. If you're in here, are you making visual saying, hey, look, at, under that tarp is probably a, or someone has already told you, hey, that ship, how do well, you... Well, remember, we had pictures of about... Ten or twelve ships that were known oh, infiltrators. People that did, this is these are the and bad we were guys. carrying them along with us. Oh, okay. And we would try to uh, see when we flew by it. We would try to see whether it looked like the one we saw. Okay. But you're talking about looking at the the bow line where the ladder is on the back, what color the tarpaulin is over here, and things like that. And so we would have people in all the windows, and then when we would fly by it, we'd all get together and go. What'd you see? What'd you see? What'd you see? <laughs> okay. And when you do this, we're flying 200 miles an hour at 200 this feet. This is not easy stuff. No. So everybody saw something different, and you would try to decide whether that was actually a, a trawler or not. Okay. If it was, we had a belly-mounted camera. Okay, not belly one, meaning yeah, down not, here. Not one in the plane. And if we thought oh. it was, we would radio it in, and they would tell us to come back to the base so they could download the film from the okay. camera. And then some other poor sucker would have to take off and go out and watch him while we were gone. You're kidding me. So we didn't want to call in unless we were pretty sure yeah. it was it was actually. It's not a lot of waste of time and yes. effort. Did you? Did, but you did not have the capability, or you did not ever fire upon them. That wasn't your job. We later got the harpoon missile, which was an air to service oh, missile. Okay. But during Vietnam, we did not have did that, not. and we didn't really have anything that would really sink a, a trawler. And they just wanted, and plus we were in, uh, we were in international waters. So, so you could. we couldn't you could. have done it anyway. And uh, we had to get people that were in to the coast and to intercept them to be able to do that. Now the people in the coast intercepting, are they, I call them, no, this was muddy water. Are these big ships, little ships, all ships? What, who would, who would intercept? It's actually both big ships and small ships. Oh, big and so small. You, have, you have some Navy ships, you okay. had Coast Guard ships. I'll give you an example of one that was sunk, which one of the significant ships that followed it was a Coast Guard cutter. And then when they get in closer, you actually have gunboats and things like that. And then you have planes that can come shoot at them and things okay. like that. And was it a protocol to warn them first or just fire first and ask Once questions Once they came later? into territorial waters, okay, fire they would first. go over the foghorn. Okay. But okay. Okay. when I first got there, one of the first ones that we detected was sunk by the surface ships when it tried to go in. Okay. What then happened was, and this happened over much of the uh, years that we did this, is that they got a little smarter, so they knew that if a plane flew by them, when we first used to fly Meaning by them. Meaning the people in the trawler, yeah. Yeah, for, when we first flew by them and we were trying to identify it, we would fly around and around and around it and Thinking, look at it a, b yes. a bunch of times. And then finally they said, you're just giving away that they've been detected, so don't, you were only. Stay in international waters. Then they said, you can only fly by once, so you get one pass. Oh, that's it. Yeah, and then you all get together and try to decide whether you thought you had one or not. Mm -hmm. And it was dubious, but it, w it was difficult. But if the if the trawlers saw us come by, they tended to back off and okay. not go in right. Try then. not to land later. Let me let me let me go back just a second again for us non. So there were six of you on the plane. Is that right? No, it's a crew of about eleven or twelve. Right, so two are flying the plane. Pilot, copilot. And correct me when I'm There's wrong. There's a pilot, copilot, flight engineer, okay, navigator tactical coordinator, which is what I was, right. who runs the mission in the back. And then there's sonar operators who listen in the water if we're looking for submarines, right. radio operator, and a guy that drops things out of the plane. Now, we are armed with torpedoes and things like that for oh, you could drop going torpedoes. after submarines, but oh, submarines. we weren't. 
Well, let me let me. There wasn't you know, any point to carrying those looking for a trawler. No. Or did you uh, again? Just off your wish. Did you ever run into a Russian or Chinese submarine? I mean, the Vietnamese didn't have submarines, or did they? The only time during the Vietnam War there were submarines in the South China Sea was after the Paris peace talks failed, okay. and they mined Haiphong Harbor. And the Russians then deployed about five nuclear submarines yeah, into right. the South China Sea. So that was the only time, that was in 72, that we actually looked for Russian submarines. So we did occasionally find one. You would find them. And it was because there was a carrier there on the Yankee station, and it didn't really like there being a cruise missile submarine out there no. somewhere. <laughs> So they'd want us to go find them. Okay, just to protect the carrier, right? The problem was is that you had hundreds of ships in the oh, South China how could Sea. You do it's that? a really shallow a fisherman and, it's yes. really shallow ocean and um, the wa the sound in the water is not good. So okay. it wasn't a very good place to be looking for submarines, but it wasn't a very good place to be a submarine yeah. either. So, so that wasn't a big it issue. It ended up issue. not being a big uh, issue relative to that, but other than that it was just looking for these infiltrators. And that and was you, men you mentioned a couple of these craft were shot. Did we lose many pilots and crews over the Vietnam no, War? The, no, not, not from P-3s. Okay. Um, there were the ones that, like I said, early in the war where we were flying at night that got shot down and they backed off on that pretty quickly. Okay. Um, and that was because of this big searchlight to just give them away. Yeah, air. so it meant that you, you had to be there first at first light. So you would get up at three o'clock in the morning <laughs> pre-flight, get, okay. get out there, so you're right there starting the, looking for them right when the sun is coming up, and then you stay out there for your 10 or 11 hours and, and uh, then come back in. So when we got to the point where we realized we could only fly by them once. That must have been difficult. We wanted something to help us out. Yes. So we turned to advanced technology of the day. I'm afraid to called ask what? Polaroid land camera. <laughs> My Polaroid. <laughs> we went to the Navy Exchange and bought ourselves a Polaroid land camera. <laughs> and you start taking pictures. And we take a picture of it because then it would come right out, right? Okay, so, you see it and then you could all analyze yeah. it. Yeah. Now, the Polaroid land camera wasn't designed for 200 miles an hour no. at 200 feet. It's like a blur, isn't it? It wasn't so much a blur as a little speck. Okay, okay. <laughs> But we would get a magnifying glass and we'd sit there and look it. at it and you could actually help yourself out a little bit. Joe, again, how, what's the lowest, I mean, can you, could you, what's the lowest you could actually fly? I mean, can you get we did 10 not, feet above or not? For safety purposes, okay. you, you flew, you didn't go below 200 feet. Usually. Oh, so you're, you're fairly up not there. Not to yeah. say that there wasn't times we went below 200 <laughs> feet, but generally speaking, you that didn't was, do that. That was a rule. Yeah, and the, in, in truth, when you're flying for 10 or 11 hours, a lot of the flight you'd be up at about maybe a thousand feet okay. looking on your radar to find the boat. Try to spot something. And then when you see a boat, then you go down and do this. Okay, come close so and take pictures. So you can go look at it and okay. take pictures and get a good look at it. What was, let me go back again. So give me, we were 10 or 11 air hours in the flight. So what was a day like? Did you, did you fly like a mission and have a day off or did you, how did, how did that work? Yeah, usually you didn't fly every day. Okay. So there were enough crews that you could take turns. Oh, he's okay, so. There would be, like I said, there would be three planes in Vietnam or Thailand, and you were flying one of these every day. And then sometimes, like I said, if somebody thought they found one, then there was a ready alert aircraft that would be launched out there he's to, out there to right follow away. them while they were looking at the pictures. So you usually had other planes that were flying at that time. And interestingly, even during a war, you have to keep training the pilots. Pilots sure. have to train regularly so they're safe. And so sometimes you would have a plane that was just taking the pilots out for their refresher. Practice, little refresher course. Refresher thing. And so uh, there was other flying that went on while you were there. And during those years, uh, the Indian Ocean was just opening up. Okay. And so out of Thailand in particular, every so often they would send us on a flight to see to something see, in the Indian... Well, we'd come out of the Straits of Malacca just to see who's going out here and where okay. are they going? Because the in intel guys wanted to know who, who was going across the Indian Ocean. Was it Russian ships? Was it Chinese ships? And so w they, they'd have times where we'd just go out and see, pass information back about who's plying who's, these who's, trade who's on routes. the water. Now, Joe, is a, again, as a non-pilot and a non-Navy, was it 10 or 11 hours in a plane, like 10 or 11 hours in a car driving here to Florida? I mean, is it exhausting physically and mentally? Or? It, it was tiring at the end of the day, but it's, it's uh, up and down. Okay. So you're not just sitting out there looking out the window the whole time. All right, so you have it other chores. And, okay. Yeah, but you might see, like I said, there was hundreds of these fishing boats. Yeah. So you might see, you go down and there'd be three or four of them 
that you'd go around. And then every once in a while, you'd see a, a Russian ship would be out there. A, a trawler or something, or actual naval vessel? No, because the Russians are big fishermen, too. Yes, yes, so you yes, might yes, see cool. Russian ones. Okay. And everybody would get excited when they would see the hammer and sickle on the thing. So <laughs> Some guy out there fishing. Get, get you more interested. But really, it was all about trying to find these ones that were intelligence had told okay. us were the ones that were coming in. And often, once they, if you flew by them, you could tell if they noticed you, because then they would start wandering Doing around things. and going south and going okay. out for a while and then okay. coming back in. So they had their, obviously, when they saw you, they started doing, they had a SOP. And then they would hope you'd lose them again and then try okay. it. They didn't, and so sometimes we just chased them around for days, waiting to see if they would come in again. Go in. And once that happened, you didn't really, you weren't supposed to go back down and fly by them again because we didn't want them to know that we were him. following them around. So can so. you go back to your map? I just want to ask a, a geographic question. Take your time. There's no rush. So again, those that aren't familiar with the Vietnam War, now, do I assume that uh, the, they would take, where would they pick up the, I mean, would they do this type of trip? or where? Right, how, yeah. right up here is Hainan okay. Island, which All is right. just off the south of China. And that's where they came out of. Okay, so they'd pick up the weapons or the armaments yes. there. And, and then, then they would come down here and then either go in up here or try to go in. Usually they were trying to get into the Mekong Delta because that's where that's the Viet where the Cong were. Yeah, okay. And so they would come down the coast somewhere here, hide amongst the fishing boats, and, and work their way down here. And um, this is, you know, I Corps, the northern part of Vietnam, is where, where the Marines were fighting right, the North right. Vietnamese regulars. And then down here in the middle of Vietnam is where Saigon and everything else was. And then out here, out here was the Ho Chi Minh Trail. So the north is also carrying stuff Weapons down the Ho down Chi Minh Trail okay. down that way. And the war was being fought all over the place um, in the Mekong Delta because that's where the rice paddies were and all of the, the Viet Cong soldiers. And I, I know, you know, we're reading a book right now about uh, James Rowe who yes. was one of the longest captured uh, army guys, and he, that's where he was. was he's, he right was there. captured on a mission right down here okay. in the Mekong Delta. Joe, as you look upon this, what, did, did the system work? I mean, were we able to intercept it? So over time, there's actually a pretty good summary of it now that okay. I look online. It's, the internet thing is wonderful, so it's, yes. I still don't understand it very much, but you can go, <laughs> Nobody look, already you can go look stuff up. But uh, yeah, I, I was looking it up, and a lot of it, they actually track both ones that were sunk, which oh, they were, actually able to try. Okay. Which there were probably about the ones that were actually sunk was probably in the ten to twenty range. Ten to over twenty. Time. Over what time. Over time. What mostly was happening was they were turned around and go back, and they were stopped from coming in. So over the, now, make sure I understand this. This is from '66 or so and up only until ten we, sunk. Yeah. Really? Because they were smart enough. They were good. And we don't know how many actually got in. Yeah. yeah. But it's uh, like the drug traffickers coming down. Yeah. There's the probably some that made it through. And I'm going to give you an example of one that was sunk in 1971, which is impressive because it was by the time that they knew they were being watched. Yes. So this, this captain of this trawler was determined to complete He's, his I'm mission. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to get in there. And, um, and it was interesting because later on I discovered that I actually was participated in the mission. The sinking. Oh, okay. Not the, not the actual I, sinking of it, but it turned out later that I was one of the P3s that was out there when we found him out okay. there before he tried right. to make the run in. And um, it was in 1971, which was my second time over there. So how many tours did you do in Vietnam? I went back three times oh, during three the war. three times? Yeah. Because you'd, you'd be over there for six months, you'd go home. Okay. So wasn't a full year months. like the, us GIs had to do on the ground? No, you'd do six about months. six months, and you'd go back for... A couple of months, and then you come back for another six months. Okay. In, at parts of the war, you'd be over there even longer than that, depending on what was going on. Sometimes they would extend you and things okay. like that. But um, I discovered this because I was—I have a friend who was in the uh, light attack squadron that flew OV-10 Broncos, which is a propeller That's, plane, okay. uh, close air support kind of plane, and flew out of South Vietnam. And um, his squadron was called the. Uh, Black Ponies. Black Ponies. And their history is really proud of the fact that they participated in sinking uh, ocean-going ship, okay. in the case of this trawler, uh, which was the first time that happened since World War II. Mm. 
since World War II. Yeah, well, we haven't really had I mean, been yeah, in, this, Korea, in the business I mean, of sinking ships no, at no. sea, right? So, North Koreans didn't send a lot of ships. So it was a big deal in the squadron history, and I'm okay. reading about it because a good friend of mine was in that squadron. Okay. And then when I, I looked up the story of it, which is what this is here, and I'll, sinking an enemy I'll leave it here. It's what was written up in their history. And I'm looking at it, and I realized that it said uh, who all participated in it. And um, it talks about how while we were on patrol in the Gulf of Thailand, which is off to the side over here, this is the Gulf of Thailand over here. You can see it's coming around it going here. Um, okay. They detected a ship, and they called a Coast Guard cutter that was there. And, and that, was, that was that ship? The that, Morgenthau, that's what, okay, this, that's what, that's this, what is this is here, the Morgenthau. And he actually went and started to track the guy himself okay. from the So he's chasing surface. him in the, in yeah. the water. And there's P3s out there kind of watching too until he decided to come in. And I went and looked up my flight log records and discovered that and I was one of the P3s in the early oh, stages wow. of finding him. Okay. I wasn't there when they sank him. But you were part of the tracking. But early group. on finding him, I was part of that uh, contingent that did that. And this was in uh, April of 1971. And it included all of the gunboats, the Morgenthau, some other destroyers, and a bunch of planes flying out. So this of is the, a big operation, all of a sudden. Well, once they, once this guy made it apparent that he was actually going to try to in. complete the mission, goodbye. They went after him, and they had a a big. Uh, the P threes at the end were were putting out flares, so you could see. Oh, you see this guy. <laughs> see the guy, and uh, and they were just going down and shooting him up until he until they sank it. They just got rid of it. So it was um, an example of of actually sinking the thing, and and. Uh, the press release said the Republic of Vietnam and U.S. Naval Forces Sunday night sank a large North Vietnamese trawler detected in the South Vietnamese territorial waters. Approximately a 160-foot enemy vessel was intercepted just before midnight heading towards the shore a few miles from the South China Sea so this coast. This was a big deal. Yeah. This is a big deal. So it was, they, they hadn't really had a, they hadn't really sunk one for, most of the ones that were sunk were earlier on in, right. in the late 60s. So we were chasing them away for a long time, but we we get frustrated because they wouldn't let us sink them. <laughs> they were smart enough not to go in there. And I've spent many hours at night, through the night, trying to keep track of one that we had detected Check earlier. It, to see what it was doing. In case he started to go back okay. in again. And uh, so it was a real cat and mouse game that went, went on with him. Kind of a part of the war most of us don't right. know anything about. Whenever I think about the war, we think about the parts that everybody's familiar with. The Marines on the ground, GIs on the ground. Fighting through the rice paddies, the bombing, of, the, bombing yeah. of the north, the uh, SAM missiles coming up, yeah, yeah. carrier launching planes and stuff like that. But there were a whole, and then there's the swift boats that were going yes. in the riverine forces. And there's all these people. different pieces of the war that everybody doesn't see all at once. And, and this was part of that. It was, a, it was an operation that was important to keeping the arms out of the South. Joe, what do you think, again, give me, throw out any figure, over the 10-year period, how many Americans were involved in this particular chore? I mean, thousands, hundreds? It would have been thousands. Yeah. It would have been thousands. Yeah. So this was a major part of the war that we don't know about. There was always two, there was always two squadron, two full squadrons were always active and they were in the together. Philippines and, and a third of those squadrons were in either Vietnam or Thailand. Now, when Vietnam was over, I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit. When Vietnam was over, did you go back to Hawaii or where were you? We went back to Hawaii because, you know, there was these Russian submarines. You we, had another choice. We were supposed to. And, and the truth <laughs> is, even when we were going to Vietnam, when we came back to Hawaii, we were still, still flying watching. up looking for Russian submarines. Now, how long did you do the Russian submarine uh, My whole cat career. Mouse? My oh, whole, whole career. career. Yeah. You spent a whole career doing that. Well, the Russians would send submarines out into the Pacific with ballistic missiles and Obviously, the uh, strategic forces of the U.S. Yeah, wanted to know where they know were. Where they are, yes. And so we would get sent out to to see them and uh, locate no, them. No visual or sonar or, or both. Or? No, this was totally secret stuff. I mean, oh, secrets. Okay. They were. We would. We were not allowed to send any radio transmissions when we went out there because okay. so they this didn't. This is hush hush. Okay. But it's it, it's a cat and mouse game too because the truth of the matter was. Submarines under the water can detect P3s even if they're up at 20,000 feet. Oh, they feet. can pick you up. They can pick up the noise your engines are making. Uh, can you pick Just like we up? can pick up oh, okay. noises that so they're making. So it is making. a cat and mouse game. And so sometimes, plus then satellites came along. So Change satellites everything. could see who's 
flying where. And so we would, I remember going on missions in the, in the 80s that uh, I would go in and get a briefing. My crew would get briefed to go out and look for this Russian submarine. And then the briefing officer would say, okay, you stay behind. I was like the mission commander. And I'd be there and they'd say, okay, we're sending you somewhere where we don't think the Russian submarine is. But don't tell your crew because I want them to work real hard looking for them. <laughs> okay. And the reason was it's operational deception. Okay. They know that the satellites can track where we're going. So, okay. If their satellites can see that we're always going to where they know their submarines are, that's not good They're for the change. Russians. They're gonna, yeah, okay. yeah, that's not good for the Russians. And the thing that really changed it for us in the anti-submarine warfare world was John Walker. You remember John uh, Walker, the spy sold, here in D.C.? sold our secrets. His yes. family, and they yes. sold... He, he sold secrets of all of our reports on what our nuclear subs were doing. And at that time, uh, the Russians realized that we were kicking their ass. Okay. And so all of a sudden, you could watch the submarines when they came out, that the more money was being spent on them by the Russians, and they got quieter. Russian okay. submarines were much noisier than our submarines when I first got into the business. By the end, they had submarines that were just as quiet as ours were. Hard to pick up. Which made More it deceptive. even harder for us to find them, yes. Joe, what we're going to have to do in the future, because our time's about up, we're going to do a part two, right, sometime in the future. Submarines. I, I think it's, it's funny. The last two people I've had on the show, veterans, whole secret war that nobody knows about. Yeah. I mean, I certainly don't. I'm, most Americans don't. Well, look, first of all, thank you for your service. Thank you, Fred. And thank you for 10, 11 hours in yeah. a plane, which is amazing. Well, yeah, I can't stay up that long anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 10 o'clock in there. Yeah, okay, all right. good. Look, at our time is up. Uh, my name's Fred McNeil. Thank you for watching QAC TV 7. Uh, we hope to see you next time. And to all the veterans out there, we say thank you for your service. Mm -hmm.